This meeting is being recorded. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jerry Green. I work at the Pacific Council in Los Angeles, and I want to welcome you to our, um, our, our event this afternoon. Uh, think of this, this, this um, session as a kickoff of a broader project that we are doing on um, tech diplomacy partnerships, um, which is being led by Patricia Gruber, who you will meet more formally in a second. Um, Patricia is preparing a report, which is going to be published in English and Korean, about how the United States and Korea can collaborate on tech and diplomacy issues, um, focusing on, on climate change. And this is part of a broader partnership with the Korea Foundation um, and the Pacific Council. And in this regard, I want to welcome Director Lee and Amy Chu, both from the Korea Foundation, who've joined us. We were supposed to have a speaker from Korea, and she had a family emergency at the very last moment. So unfortunately, um, we will have to proceed um, without her. But we're going to be having another event on, on June 23rd uh, to discuss the findings of Patricia's report. Um, you'll all be invited, and Korea will be more prominently featured. Um, I now want to introduce everybody. Let me begin with, with, with uh, uh, Patricia Groover, who is um, uh, the Technical Diplomacy Fellow of the Pacific Council. We, we have a, a, a new initiative, new democracy, new diplomacy initiative, in which we look at different areas of diplomacy, agriculture diplomacy, health diplomacy, sports diplomacy, which is a big one in Los Angeles. So Patricia is leading the, the tech diplomacy component of this larger effort. Um, as the Pacific Council's um, um, fellow on tech diplomacy, um, she is also currently leading a science diplomacy exchange and learning program at the National Science Policy Network, where she mentors the next generation of science diplomats. And I love to hear that science we, we love diplomats who uh, didn't exist, you know, 50 or 100 years ago, and science diplomats certainly are, are part of that. Uh, prior to this, she was the research and innovation attaché, which I should pronounce attaché en français, um, for the Quebec government office in, in Boston, Massachusetts, where she facilitated research and technology partnerships between Quebec uh, and the United States. She also served as the co-chair of the Science and Technology Diplomatic Circle in Boston, which was an organization of 67 countries with international offices in the Boston, in the Boston region. And, and as a native Bostonian, I'm always happy to recognize Boston is a hotbed of all sorts of uh, important innovation. Many of my friends at Amgen, which is a major pharmaceutical company, have left to move to Boston to work at Moderna. Um, simply because Moderna, because of vaccinations and so forth, is so important. So I'll be, after I introduce our two guest speakers, I'm going to turn it over to Patricia. She will moderate, and I will be a fly on the wall. Uh, our next speaker, and I'm going alphabetically, is, is uh, Pat, uh, Matt Peterson, who's the president and CEO of the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator. Um, the incubator is creating an inclusive green economy by unlocking um, innovation, um, more specifically incubating leading startups, transforming markets, uh, which means to create aspirational partnerships and enhancing community, which um, is, is meant to, to inspire future entrepreneurs and entrepreneurships. Its three priorities are accelerating transportation, electrification, clean energy, and sustainable cities, which are all at the heart of, of, of the mission of the Pacific Council, which is all about global LA. And we always say Los Angeles is the future, but only sooner. Um, so this clearly defines Matt and his work. And finally, last but not least, um, also based in Los Angeles, Dr. Susan Ying. Um, Dr. Ying is the Senior Vice President of Global Partnerships for Ampere. She's also a director and board member for the Lindbergh Foundation um, and the immediate past president of the International Council of the Aeronautical Sciences, serving on the executive committee, um, which leads in shaping the agenda of this multinational professional aerospace organization. And I was boasting to Dr. Ying that a former ambassador to the International Civil Aeronautics Authority, 
um, is, is, is a member of the Pacific Council board. And he, before that, was the chairman of the board of LAX. So this is an, uh, an area of great importance uh, to us. It is hard to believe when you see her, but Dr. Ying has devoted 38 years to the aerospace industry. She started when she was in grammar school, I think. And uh, <laughs> she's got experience at NASA, um, Boeing, and most recently the Commercial Aircraft Corporation of China as the chief integration officer. I'm really so pleased to welcome our guest speakers. Um, Patricia, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I'm gonna turn off my camera. We will be back in touch with all of you June 23rd at our next event in, in which Korea will be more, um, um, more, more um, deeply involved than, than because of uh, uh, our losing our speaker today. So um, Matt, Patricia, Susan, over to you. Thank you all so much. I'm gonna turn off my camera and, and watch. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the panelists for taking the time to be here today and the Korea Foundation for making this panel and you know this, this uh, larger discussion about tech and diplomacy and climate change um, a possibility. Um, and so just a uh, background, um, the Korea Foundation is a nonprofit a public diplomacy organization that promotes proper awareness and understanding of Korea and works to enhance goodwill and friendship throughout the international community. Um, and then to kind of give context for this discussion, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, climate and um, tech companies really quick, and then we'll launch into the um, Q&A part of the panel. So um, two thirds of US adults are concerned about the tech industry's impact on climate. And 73% 73 believe that tech companies have an obligation to address um, this crisis according to an exclusive survey conducted um, on behalf of protocol. Um, you know, the tech industry accounts for about two to 3% of global emissions um, and big tech contributes around 0.3%. Um, and this may not seem like much, but it amounts to um, millions of metric tons of carbon dioxide produced annually. Um, just today at Davos, um, a group known as the First Movers Coalition announced major climate commitments and intended to create uh, markets for everything from green steel to aluminum um, and to carbon dioxide removal. Um, some of the big companies uh, as part of this discussion were Microsoft Alphabet and Salesforce. Um, and this coalition includes uh, more than 50 companies that have a total market cap of about $8.5 trillion. Um, the coalition last, launched last year at the UN Climate Talks as an initiative that was spearheaded by climate envoy John Kerry and Bill Gates. Um, the focus then was mostly on steel, um, shipping and aviation, and um, all sectors of the economy that are incredibly hard and costly to decarbonize. Um, so uh, Wednesday's announcement was um, the first time as part of this coalition that carbon dioxide removal was thrown into the mix um, along with green aluminum. And the trio of major tech companies that I mentioned earlier um, collectively committed $500 million to carbon dioxide removal between now and 2030. Um, and Alphabet joined a handful of other tech companies in pledging $925 million to purchase um, carbon dioxide removal services last night, uh, last month, sorry. Uh, getting tech industry buy-in is essential to tackling global challenges like climate change. Uh, this is why more and more governments are engaging with tech giants in Silicon Valley around issues such as tech for democracy, digital human rights, disinformation, and cybersecurity. And it's not just government and, and tech in these discussions. This is also a multi-stakeholder approach that includes civil society and academia. And since these uh, conversations around digital global challenges are already happening, it makes sense that uh, we can collaborate together and discuss uh, climate change as well when we have these um, dialogues with, with, tech, with tech companies. Um, in 2021, a European Green Digital Coalition was formed to support the sustainability of the tech sector. Um, its members include Microsoft, IBM, and the Vodafone Group. You know, thinking about this going forward, it's essential to have a broad uh, cross-national consensus on the climate change approach, both within big tech organizations and globally. Um, and then another leader in the climate space is Korea. 
Uh, there are currently 13 South Korean companies, part of the RE100 in initiative, Renewable Energy 100. Uh, it's a global initiative bringing together the world's most influential businesses committed to 100% renewable energy, electricity, sorry. Um, this includes some of South Korea's largest companies, um, such as industrial giant SK Group, um, which joined in 2020, um, LG enlisted in 2021, um, and stated that it would slash carbon emissions by 50% by 2030. Um, other enormous companies in South uh, Korea rallying to the net zero call include POSCO, Lot Chemical, and Hyundai. Um, it's imperative that tech companies are part of this multi-stakeholder process of developing solutions to tackle climate change. Um, and companies and incubators like the ones we have here today have been working hard to develop new technologies to help target our climate goals. Um, and just a few days ago, during the Yoon uh, Biden summit, the two presidents also agreed to enhance cooperation to address methane emissions globally, recognizing the importance of the global methane pledge and rapid global action needed to address methane. And the two presidents also decided to strengthen cooperation in clean energy fields such as hydrogen, clean shipper, sh shipping, accelerated deployment of zero emissions vehicles, and aligning international financial flows with global net zero emissions by 2050 and deep reductions in the 2020s. Um, and like uh, Jerry mentioned earlier, this is the beginning of a two-part discussion on how we can leverage technology to solve today's global challenges. Um, today, we'll be exploring how technology can be used to address climate change. In a few weeks, we'll be talking about how diplomacy with tech giants can help promote tech for democracy and digital human rights. Um, and, you know, of these, you know, these com both of these, um, for these discussions, uh, the concentration is how can we tackle global solutions with local solutions? So I'm excited to have uh, Mr. Matt Peterson and, and Dr. Susan Ying here today. So my first question um, to both of you is thinking about um, collaboration between governments, businesses and civil society, and how that's essential to tackling the climate crisis. How can we improve channels of collaboration to um, accelerate climate change action? Well, I mean start. Um, well, thanks for having us. Good to see you, Susan. Um, I, I mean, I think uh, I'll just give an example we have here regionally. Um, we, uh, we created the Transportation Electrification Partnership, um, bringing together the mayor, the county, the Metro, uh, Metropolitan Transit Authority, or Metro, um, <clears throat> the Air Resources Board in California, the most important regulator in the world right now, air regulator and climate regulator. And uh, uh, a number of private sector companies and utilities um, uh, and some labor groups and other local governments to say, how do we go further faster together by the time the world arrives for the Olympics here in Los Angeles in 2028, how can we reduce greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution by an additional 25% while accelerating progress on getting zero emission dredge trucks on the road uh, to be 40% of the trucks on the road on the way to 100% goal by 2035. So in this case, and we're working to take action here regionally and locally, uh, yet we're needing to pull levers uh, and work with partners um, statewide, nationally, and globally. And if you look at, well, we're not uh, currently looking to address the ships. We do have an in intention in our zero emissions roadmap to begin electrification of trains and explore marine um, solutions. And uh, with uh, goods movement from Asia, uh, predominantly coming um, from Asia uh, through the 40% the of the goods that go through the port, um, ports of LA and Long Beach, um, you know, those are also not only a source of huge economic growth and jobs in LA, but they're a huge source of air pollution, the largest in fact, in aggregate. Um, so you know, we're connected in so many ways and how we take climate action uh, relies on uh, the corporate partners that we have uh, that include you know, Audi and, and BMW, both headquartered in Germany, um, focusing on Los Angeles. Why are they focusing both spending money and time uh, on this partnership in Los Angeles when uh, it's you know, far away from third quarter, it's their largest market outside of China. So um, 
we uh, really look to, to try to bring together those partners to, to accelerate progress. And you know, when I was with uh, Mayor Garcetti on his um, uh, trade mission to Asia, we spent time in Japan and Korea and uh, Vietnam uh, and uh, Hong Kong. And you know, our, our connection to the Pacific Rim on climate uh, in particular is so important. We hosted the US-China Climate Leader Summit when I was with working for the mayor, um, uh, bring together US and, and Chinese mayors to demonstrate the commitment to action um, that helped provide some of the wind at the back for the Obama administration to strike the deal with China. Um, and how do these mayors get this done? By working with the private sector, as well as using the power of the purse and the policy power of city hall. So um, I, you know, I think it, it's fundamental. And, you know, just to tee up, Susan, we're, the excitement of uh, companies like Amp Air, who we incubated and, and now are off flying on their own, um, so to speak. Uh, uh, you know, the innovation that comes from startups in the context of the largest Los Angeles and California ecosystems is critical to the success and decarbonizing our economy. Um. So uh, from a startup's perspective, um, I think there are um, uh, two or actually three fronts um, that I can mention in terms of the collaboration uh, between public and private uh, in this case. Of course, um, in the first area is in terms of the development. And as Matt had just mentioned that, you know, we were actually incubated in LACI. And, um, and then we were hatched. <laughs> so, because once when, when we build our airplane, it's starting to grow out of the LACI labs. It's just so big and then it has to fly. So it can't just taxi on the LA traffic <laughs> and to the airports, right? So we had to move away to, uh, to a local airport, which uh, is a hall form where we're based. And by the way, that's also where SpaceX uh, used to be and also, uh, well, I think they're still there. Uh, and Tesla uh, at the same, they're, they're our neighbors. So in terms of development, we were hashed in LACI, but um, we're also getting other types of uh, government funding. And uh, in fact, at the moment, in fact, we have a, uh, a part of our team is now in Colorado uh, with the ARPA-E. Uh, I think they have an exhibit right now. Uh, ARPA-E, uh, this is a, a couple of projects that we're working on with the Department of Energy. So um, what we are doing there is uh, we have uh, this prototype aircraft where we successfully developed the technology and now we're testing even new, newer technologies that will be more efficient, that will be um, faster. So we, um, we test these technologies that's not necessarily from Ampere, but we were able to use our what we call the flying test bed, um, um, put it into our system and flight test it. Um, so that's been a very, very successful program. And at the same time, we also work with NASA. So NASA has quite a few of these uh, SBIR uh, projects for the SME, uh, small, medium uh, size en uh, enterprises. And so uh, we, we were looking into a concept such as um, um, we call it uh, boundary layer ingestion, which is a different uh, electric uh, propulsion device. And so, uh, so all these high risk, uh, very innovative projects that the government is helping, helping us with uh, putting in the, the seed money to start. So that's, very, that's been very, very helpful. Um, also, as the technologies mature, you know, from this uh, seed level, all the way to the um, application uh, level so that, you know, we're going to take it to the market. Um, there's also other uh, issues that need to be addressed. Uh, like, for example, if you have an electric airplane, then you got to charge. Uh, if it's a plug-in type, then you have to charge it. So there's going to be infrastructure. And unlike the uh, automotive uh, uh, challenge, you just put the chargers uh, somewhere along the you know, the road highway somewhere, while as uh, electric chargers for airplanes are likely to be on the airports. So, um, and then airports, of course, when you charge these, you cannot just uh, uh, black out the whole airport too, because, you know, we have a whole fleet of airplanes requiring these megawatts uh, type level of charging. So, so we've got to work with this whole ecosystem um, of the uh, power distribution of the uh, power supply at the airport. And also, of course, the airport has their own long-term 
plan too in terms of their infrastructure improvements. So we got to work with the ecosystem. And I think particularly in California, there are these uh, policies to uh, update the infrastructure. And so, um, so we're working with a couple of the uh, suppliers there as well as the airport on um, this type of uh, projects. Um, and last year we were able to have a really interesting collaboration uh, with the UK, uh, the UK partners. This is a funded UK project. Um, by the way, in, uh, in the uh, United Kingdom, what they have is a uh, top, uh, top down kind of uh, uh, flight zero goal that started with Boris Johnson. So he has a council that really devotes, uh, you know, that has the goal of reaching the zero emission for aerospace by 2050, particularly for the UK. And so, um, so we're funded one of those projects and um, the uh, collaboration is with the whole ecosystem. So that would include academia and also other research labs and also uh, some of the, uh, for example, a electric a battery uh, supplier partner. So that's been very interesting. In fact, through that collaboration, we were able to do a market survey sort of flight um, all the way from the most northeastern part of uh, UK to the southwestern. So that's kind of an iconic kind of a, a flight. And um, it was very adventurous because not everywhere has the uh, uh, charger yet. So we have a ground crew trying to catch up, you know, <laughs> with the van uh, carrying all the all the uh, charging and also uh, the spare battery and things like that, just in case. Um, so we achieved that. We broke the record of the longest flight for hybrid electric aircraft, and that was 408, uh, 418 nautical miles, which is equivalent to 480 statute miles. So nobody has done that before, we're the first ones. And thanks to the UK government and also the US government in terms of helping with the seedling. Of course, we have to thank, be thankful for our uh, venture um, uh, partner as well. So that's, uh, that's been a, a great journey so far. That's great news and congratulations on breaking that record. That's, that's really cool. Um, you know, with, with big tech, we've seen um, them go fast and break things. And I think with some of this new technology that's trying to address climate change, we're trying to avoid that scenario. Um, so how can companies that are working on these technologies work with government to develop the technology responsibly and also help them develop standards and regulations so that we can get this technology in use um, sooner rather than later? Um, Does anyone go first? Yeah. yeah, sure. Um, one of my roles is that I also sit on the um, board of directors for SAE International. SAE used to stand for a Society of Automotive Engineers. Um, and because uh, uh, if you look at most of the automotive uh, parts, they should have uh, SAE, whatever standard numbers there are. So, so it used to be automotive, but they also uh, have a huge part of aerospace. In fact, they're the biggest aerospace standards uh, provider uh, in, in the world right now. And so uh, as, uh, as you can imagine with the new technologies come uh, a lot of new standards. And um, so for example, like right now, if you have an electric vehicle, whether it's Tesla or uh, Lucid or other kind of uh, electric cars or Zero or uh, Neo, and um, if you go to the different chargers, you may or may not be able to use it um, unless you carry this huge uh, adapter. And even that, you know, the level of uh, the voltage or, or something, it may not just work. So you gotta be careful. Well, as uh, in aerospace industry, we really cannot afford that, especially if you fly to a different airport, you definitely want to make sure you have the right charger to, to charge it. So we try to work all of these standards issues such that we really have these standards that, that is uniform, that is global. And so in order to do that, I think there could be a lot of collaborations going on. And um, for example, in the aerospace uh, uh, standards, uh, the top governing organization is ICAO, and that's International uh, um, Civil Aviation Organization. And, uh, and then so they oversee all the uh, country organizations such as FAA in the US and YASA in Europe or CAAC in China. 
and uh, in Canada is Transport Canada. And so even though these bodies, uh, these uh, per country bodies work individually, but they do harmonize in terms of the new, uh, new standards uh, formulation. And uh, so in order to do that, uh, especially with the new technologies, because right now there's quite a competition going on, particularly in aerospace, as uh, like right, right now, as we speak, there's like two to 300 startups trying to work in the electric or hydrogen airplanes uh, space. And so uh, in order to get these uh, vehicles into service, everybody has to get certified. And that requires these new regulations and standards. And so there's a, a little bit of a competition between, for example, FAA and EASA and the CAA of uh, UK. And so we all need to be working together. At the same time, the companies are still competing with their technology. So it's a very, very interesting space. Um, but certainly, we do need to harmonize all the standards so that in the future, we're not going to repeat the kind of mistakes in the uh, EV industries. Uh, you know, of course, Elon Musk has a lot of uh, uh, money himself to build all those chargers. But, uh, you know, in general, I think we, we should be great uh, global citizens such that we can work with, with each other to make this work. Yeah, I think uh, just to add uh, Susan's comments, I think, you know, as we look to I mean, our roles to de-risk uh, startups, um, meaning how do we help them work through whatever their barriers are to scale. I mean, and just to point out what may be obvious to some, not obvious to others is you, know, you, you may have a small to medium sized business that's trying to solve a part of the climate crisis. But and when you really think about a startup, what is what is it different than a small business? There's a lot of the same basics that, that apply, but startups looking to scale, how do they help scale their solutions? Not just for growth, for growth's sake, uh, you know, a lot of uh, tech startups out of the Silicon Valley, you know, the philosophy you talked about um, is all about, you know, getting as much VC capital as quickly as you can and uh, getting the highest valuation possible. Um, and, you know, you figure out your, your, your product as you go along. I mean, that's always part of any startup, including in clean tech, but our, you, you, your founders come in with a pretty clear idea of what they want to tackle. Uh, clearly they need to pivot at times if, if their product market fit isn't, isn't what they think it is. Uh, but um you know, it's really at the core, they're trying to solve a, a societal challenge, a business model challenge, a technological challenge that uh, is sometimes hardware focused, sometimes software focused, sometimes both, sometimes service focused. Um, one of our startups, Charger Help, is focused on how to maintain the chargers once they're installed. Uh, uh, they, then when 30% of the chargers are often down and when they are 80% of the time, it's a non-electrical issue, meaning somebody needs to diagnose, is it a Wi-Fi connection problem? Is it a software problem? What, what is it that's keeping those uh, stations to be inoperable? So when somebody shows up, even if it says on their app, it's, it's working, that uh, it actually is working. <clears throat> So, you know, I think we're really, we're really focused on helping our startups, you know, get, get to the level Ampere obviously is, and, and others are, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, de-risking the technology, the, the business, uh, so they can attract more capital to grow the company. And one of the things that we've been doing is uh, deploying a micro loan program for some of our startups, so they have working capital. Um, a lot of startups to get working capital will do what's known as a bridge round, meaning they're going to go out to current or other and, and new investors, sometimes friends and family, sometimes angels, sometimes more established VCs uh, to finance the, you know, their growth um, in between uh, you know, significant priced rounds. So it, 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 but that's expensive. Venture capital is, is costly. So how do you uh, use debt um, uh, for uh, working capital to hire the staff that you need. One of our, one of our loans was provided Spark Charge, a charging uh, focused, a mobile charging focused company. And the first market they deployed in was LA and they needed to hire some staff. So we gave them a $40,000 loan and they were able to do it with confidence. And, and they just closed a $23 million round today. Um, so a little bit of money sometimes goes a long way and it's a lot cheaper when you can provide debt. So, but to my point is just how do you help risk uh, iterate and scale uh, these solutions and and you know obviously FAA is not going to let amp air fly unless they're really mm -hmm. got a safe airplane so there's there's checks and balances but as we learn in transportation electrification a lot of things are 
or we're lear learning as we go uh, as well. Great, thanks. Um, so, you know, as, as you both mentioned, companies in this space are trying to solve a problem that government cannot solve on its own. You know, government needs the private sector to solve the climate crisis. So how can government better support um, companies that are working to develop climate solutions? I can start. I, you know, I think um, there's a few ways. One, uh, non-dilutive capital, meaning grants and that Ampere is using those sources of funding to help them solve problems as well as, as, as sustain and grow the business. Um, you know, governments can provide test beds. So Lacey is uh, partnered with lo several local governments, city of LA, city of Santa Monica, to figure out how we pilot solutions uh, to demonstrate their not just viability, but the use case. So uh, we did an ED car share with the housing authority of the city of Los Angeles. Not a new idea, but the, we changed the business model from uh, the startup usually provides the cars to luxury uh, property owners and their uh, residents. Um, we said, let's put these cars there. We partnered with Nissan to provide a leaf. Uh, two e N Nissan Leafs provided to the public housing residents uh, of Rancho San Pedro. Uh, first time in the nation um, dedicated only to the housing residents, high utilization. Uh, uh, so nothing new there, but it was a different use case. But, you know, needed there was some risk to the housing authority for them to give us the property to, to be dedicated for that. Uh, uh, but now they are, uh, uh, we just did a press conference with Congresswoman Annette Baragon uh, announcing her legislation, EVs for All, that we helped her craft to create a federal grant program across the country to deploy that. So you know, governments obviously can be test beds or the sandbox to, 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 to play in to figure these things out. Sometimes cities like Santa Monica, when we partnered with them to create a zero emissions delivery zone can invite the innovation in too much, too many times innovation happens to cities and they try to get in front of it to deal with it. We saw that with ride share, we saw it with scooters um, and, uh, and how do they invite the innovation that's going to help solve cities' challenges from the startup and corporate innovations that are out there? And uh, so that's what we've done in Santa Monica. It's created a one square mile um, zero emissions delivery zone that's a sandbox to test and iterate these solutions as not just technological, but business model and, and policy. Yeah, so uh, it's very interesting. I, I agree with what Matt has said, um, but also I'd like to go a little bit deeper on the policy side because in the aviation, the policy is uh, very, very important. So for example, like in some of the European countries, um, they already started the policy such as, uh, you know, for example, in, in France, you cannot take any domestic flights anymore. If you wanna go anywhere domestically, you gotta take a train. Similarly, I think uh, Germany is coming close to that. And uh, I heard a friend of mine the other day was saying he was going from uh, 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 Netherlands to Belgium or something, and he had to take a train, which is, uh, I mean, it's, it's only a, a few hours, but it's uh, still flying is so convenient, especially if we're going to have the electric airplanes, that would really be very, very, because one of the things is that it's so affordable, in addition to all the emission uh, uh, help that it will have. So government can uh, can set the policies to really help to accelerate um, the implementation of these new technologies. And, um, and another thing is that I think um, not here in the US yet, but also in some of the European or Northern European countries, they have the carbon offset. And so, you know, depending on, uh, you know, what kind of credit you can get uh, or what kind of uh, carbon emissions that, you know, goals that you can have, you can use these offset program to also uh, drive, uh, you know, to, to accelerate the, uh, the development of the, or implementation of these new technologies, um, sustainable technologies. Yeah, you hit it on the head, Susan. I'm, that is the absolute most important role of government is to create the markets by sending the market signals. Um, the state Air re Resources Board, you know, because California had passed the clean air law in the 60s before the federal government um, uh, and uh, various uh, rulings, um, they and state legislation, the Air Resources Board was able to uh, create a mandate for electric vehicles. Well, why is that important? It led to the EV1. It led to uh, a lot of other innovations, uh, 
of course, uh, even one was died or killed, but um, you know, it was really what uh, uh, gave, uh, you know, it was the birth of Tesla was, was sort of the policy framework in California. It was pre, you know, Elon joining. Um, but uh, what, what most importantly for Tesla's success is that was that cash flow from selling their credits from, from the electric vehicles was what got them to the valley of, at least the first valley of death. Um, so, you know, policymakers can make markets and, you um, uh, you know, the same thing with solar in California. Uh, Germany had the most aggressive solar policy in the in the in the world. Um, California came in with a close second um, with the million solar roofs and the incentives put behind it. Uh, and countries like Spain and Italy uh, and a few others had uh, similar commitments at a smaller scale. Of course, China investing in this the manufacturing of solar panels created a cost disruption in the cost of of, of the panels, but. You know, it's really the the demand that can be created uh, um, both by mandates and and price signals um, that are fundamental. Well, yeah, right. and oh, go ahead, Susan. Oh, I was just going to mention one of the things in aviation that is really exciting is that because we really need the whole ecosystem for uh, supporting the electric airplane at the airport as well as the. Uh, elect, uh, the power distribution and so on. So uh, one of the great ideas is to have the airports as the future energy hubs. And in so doing, um, because you know, airport is naturally when people fly in, they take a ground transportation somewhere. So it's really a big hub. And if you have that as an energy hub, so for example, in the US, we have the first totally uh, clean energy airport or so all solar in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee. And because, and usually at the airport, you have this vast open field, right? So you could put a lot of uh, solar panels there. I mean, some people were saying, well, that reflection and so on is bad for the pilot to see the airport or whatnot. So you could, you could place it such that it doesn't uh, interfere with the pilot's visual. But um, so Tennessee is one, and then there are other parts in the world that they have these big projects at the airport because it's a huge, usually airports are huge real estate properties. And so you could use that, uh, use that to the advantage of getting clean energy and clean energy is not just to the airplane, but for ground transportation, because, you know, you could have the solar bus or, or um, trucks from the airport taking the goods that's shipped in from air and so on. So those are some of the interesting uh, policies that some places are already starting to have, um, probably in the US somewhere too. But um, yeah, it's a great ways for, for um, the government to help the development. Yeah, and, and kind of following up on that, uh, that thread of, you know, creating a market, Susan, you had mentioned before we started the call about uh, Korea's new announcement about investment in this space. So I don't know if you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, that was just in the, uh, in the news last week, um, $1.4 billion that they invest, not for just, um, not for in, uh, investing in designing a new airplane or a new EV toll uh, that's electric vo uh, vertical takeoff and landing or flying taxis, but to enable those flying electric flying taxis to operate because in order to, for these, uh, any of uh, airplanes or um, flying taxis or whatnot to fly, the um, CAAs, the FAAs, the YASAs have to certify them. And in order to certify the new technologies, you need to have the new standards because otherwise, how are you gonna evaluate whether it's safe or not? You have to have these new standards right for these technologies. So the Korean government obviously realized that and saying, hey, in order to, ignore, uh, in order to do this, we need to study what new standards need to happen. So they invest this uh, money to do that. And in fact, that was, uh, uh, that was you know, so clear, so clearly articulated because um, right now in terms of uh, here in the US, um, the FAA is swamped with a lot of these new technologies. So for example, in one of the conferences, the FAA colleague told, told us that uh, his group has like 70 new projects to certify, 70, seven zero. As, as compared to before this uh, you know, electric revolution, you know, they, they have projects like in the, that you can count with one hand or two hands. And now they've got 70. And so uh, they really need to work that. And then the thing is that all these 70s are of different shapes, size, weight, and um, new configurations, new technologies. 
And, um, and most of those uh, people working that don't have the kind of a background. So we really have to work together with the regulators and with the standards committees in order to make this happen, to get to the market. And I think because Ampere's um, approach is really pragmatic that we're taking you know, the, the retrofit approach hitting the core technologies for propulsion. So we're you know, hand-holding and we're working with the uh, FAA uh, on, on these uh, new technologies uh, rules and so on. So this is a, a, it's a very interesting new approach. Great, thanks. And before we move on to questions from the audience, um, I wanted to ask you both, um, you know, if you had endless resources and no limitations, um, what's the wildest suggestion in this policy realm that you've heard of that you would make, um, you would turn into action? If cost is not the issue? Endless, endless resources. You, you know, it would be to require 100% uh, electric vehicles powered by 100% renewable energy. Um, that would be one. Um, certainly, we're headed that yeah. direction, but it's going to take us uh, a lot you know, longer. Yeah. 15, 20 years when the climate crisis is demanding significant cuts to actually reduction in emissions over the level we, we can't comprehend as a society. Yeah, I think just uh, everybody to work a lot faster and, and get rid of all the bureaucratic uh, requirements. <laughs> so. so government get out of the way. <laughs> well, I mean, there's- Oh, government, create, the, create, lead the way. I mean- the, Yeah, lead, the yeah, lead the way. I mean, the lead permitting it. and regulations sometimes obviously stand in the way of progress. They're there mm -hmm. for good reason. At the same time, governments, as we said earlier, set the policies that create the markets that, you know, mandates work. Voluntary agreements generally never work. Yeah, agreed. So this, um, this question is from Susan S. Um, so electric aircrafts are so exciting. Are you considering sustainability impacts of the batteries, you know, thinking about mining for the precious metals and battery recycling? Yes, absolutely. We have to work, you know, you cannot just solve a point problem, right? Because just like nuclear uh, power and so on, because you're generating this long-term effect. And so you have to work on the, the recycling issue. You have to work even the mining issue because uh, getting all these precious metals or, you know, the, the metals from the different parts of the world, um, you have to, this is a whole um, value chain and a whole ecosystem consideration. And so, yes, we do, we do have to consider that. And so for, for example, one of the things that um, say the battery, say we use on the airplane, um, while it's in the airplane, the safety concern is so important that you know, we only uh, use it for a certain number of cycles. And after that, it's still usable. We could have retired the first use and retire it to uh, airports. Remember, if we use the airport as the energy uh, hubs, then you can have these uh, first use retired batteries used as energy storage. Because once you collected all the you know, beautiful solar energy into the airport, you gotta store it somewhere. And these uh, airplane um, used batteries, uh, retired batteries could be used for that purpose. And then afterwards it could be used for other purpose and then you know, retire in, in a really um, uh, responsible way. Great. And the next question is also addressed to you, Susan. Um, will there be education around the safety um, of electric planes in case people Absolutely. are worried about that? <laughs> that's, that's actually a really great question. Um, you know, one of the nice things about us doing the uh, market survey flights, because uh, market survey is one of the experimental certificates that we got. Um, it's a, a method of testing out your, uh, your new technology, your new airplane in um, the actual routes, but of course not a very, very busy travel routes. So as we were uh, doing that in the UK, 
Uh, and, and one of the differences uh, in the airports in UK is that most of the airports in the US are public airports. In other words, our tax dollars actually go into maintain um, most of these uh, general aviation airports and, and the public airports. While it's in the UK, most of the airports are privately owned and maintained, most. And so that's quite a contrast. And as such that each airport, they do have the fire, um, uh, fire firemen, uh, fire team, fire brigades to help just in case there's any accident or anything, right? So it was very interesting because in the US, you know, you work with one airport, they, they all talk to each other, they're all FAA managed um, and mostly. And so in the UK, you have to work with them separately uh, with the airport management. So each time when we uh, go somewhere, uh, as you mentioned, you know, how uh, the, how you, you know, the safety and fight the fire and so on, it's a little bit different. So we, we generated actually a, a document together with the, uh, the airport to how to uh, put out say lithium ion battery fire um, versus, you know, how you do the, just the regular combustion engine fire or something like that. So we work with all these airports that we're going to fly along the way. And so uh, as you can imagine, once we really put into service of the airplane, then that, that wherever the uh, the customer airlines or whoever the customer that's operating these airplanes, we need to have all these uh, work together with the, the whole ecosystem. Great. And, and then the next question is, is for Matt. Um, what are some of the most, um, you know, exciting uh, emerging technologies that are at LACI at the moment? Well, other than Ampere, um, I would say, you know, we, we've seen some really exciting uh, solutions come out of companies like Electric Fish, which is um, developing a uh, fast uh, charger solution uh, that doesn't require additional electricity and also can be um, uh, resilient power in time of uh, uh, when the grid is down. Um, they're a uh, dynamic young founding team uh, for four founders, three of them underrepresented individuals uh, in tech, uh, women and people of color, particularly black and brown founders. Um, and uh, the, 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 our solution is exciting. They're getting some real traction. I talked about Spark Charge and Charger Help earlier. I think um, uh, we're uh, seeing some other companies like Zeal uh, really take off. Their solution is targeting multi-unit dwellings or apartment buildings to get charging in, in their um, uh, uh, Maxwell vehicles is another one. They're, they're, they're creative solution. They're taking totaled Model 3s. So when a Model 3 is uh, wrecked uh, and the insurance company decides it's totaled, they They'll go to a, a salvage yard and buy the motors and batteries. Uh, they're still uh, viable and repurpose them and put them in a, a, a van chassis, um, take out like a transit van and take out the internal combustion engine and convert it to an electric van. So we've got a lot of exciting uh, solutions. Um, and uh, um, we have another company, um, Delphi, that's doing uh, uh a solution, a monitoring solution to try to detect wildfires and help with preventative measures. Interesting. It all sounds really exciting. Um, something that you mentioned, Matt. Um, you know how how are how is Ampere and how are some of the um, companies at LACI thinking about how to bridge um, like the divide between um, you know people that. Um, might not have access to these technologies um, because they're women or people of color. And then also thinking about, you know, the divide between the, the North and the global South. Um, how do we ensure that these technologies don't just stay, you know, um, in the Northern hemisphere and also sure. can be um, deployed in the global South as well? Yeah, I can, I can start. Uh, you know, we are, uh, as I mentioned earlier, looking at how do we deploy vehicles in a model that makes electric vehicles uh, affordable and accessible through a sharing platform. Uh, we're working to find and secure funding to put charging into disadvantaged communities. We're working, we're going to be piloting some clean energy solutions for Building retrofits. How do we get to decarbonize? How do we decarbonize existing buildings? 
um, through technological uh, and software solutions. Um, and uh, yeah, I think th that uh, it, it's part of our mission, creating an inclusive green economy and, and how do we bring the benefits of the green economy to those frontline communities that suffer from disproportionate air pollution, uh, disinvestment, uh, historic redlining, um, and uh, and bring that investment there with without it, you know, creating other challenges like gentrification. So that's why you know something like a car share program at a public housing uh, authority gets charging in the neighborhood, but um, you know that because that service is only available to the residents. That housing authority project's not going to go away. Uh, it's not going to be purchased by you know people that look like me trying to move into an up and coming neighborhood to afford a home. Um, it's something we know can be dedicated to serve and help them get uh, 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 create economic up, up, upward mobility and be part of solving the climate crisis and reduce that air pollution they face every day from the port and the nearby freeways. Yeah, so um, in terms of uh, aviation, you know, it is an industry for connecting people and helping to, uh, you know, address all the global uh, shipping uh, very fast. And um, typically, you know, by the fossil fuel uh, powered uh, airplanes, it's, it's quite expensive. Uh, starting even from the very small ones, you know, if you have, say, uh, uh, two seat, because right now there's a two seat in all electric airplane that's been certified and in service. Um, you could see the huge difference because for a two seat airplane, it takes only three euros for the energy per hour, three euros, while as a typical combustion engine, a Cessna 150, that's how I learned how to fly. It's like a hundred and probably more now because the, the, the old gas price has gone up so much. So there's an orders of magnitude difference. And, you know, not, not to mention just the emission part, the noise part and everything, but just affordability part. It is uh, so different. Uh, and so that really, because um, right now there's a pilot shortage. Why? Because it's so expensive to fly. And from general aviation, which used to be the, the, you know, the most inexpensive way to do it rather than, you know, you have to go through the military training and all that. So now, you know, you could have you just open up the whole market and that people can start flying so you won't have the pilot shortage. And then also the operators in, in the South, operators in everywhere. That's the most exciting part about the electric aviation or sustainable aviation. And that is, it brings the affordability and really enables the regional um, air mobility such that, you know, globally, there's so many, many airports out there. And, um, and so many people could benefit from this. And so it really helped bring people together uh, affordably. And so uh, I think it's a, it's a game changer, huge game changer. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. And I feel like, you know, I have a lot of former colleagues, um, diplomats from the global south who would love to hear more about, you know, what you're working on and how they can, you know, get, um, I would add, like you know, as, as you know, Patricia, not every technology is immediately applicable to the, to, uh, let, let's say in Eastern Africa, where um, shared, uh, it has to be more of a shared motorbike or moped solution than a car or e-bike solution, given roads and mm -hmm. um, distances traveled and, um so um, how do you how do you bring those sorts of products to market there and uh, village-based solar and charging for phones and um, you know it's just we've seen so many so many innovations come out of um, the global south as well um, and how money has moved and uh, so I, I think there's obviously other things to to to, to learn too like how do we help the unbanked here um, through those financial innovations so. Uh, I, yeah, I think there's certainly a lot of tech transfer, um, uh, but it's not always appropriate technology. So we uh, sometimes it's, it, 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 it's a burden um, more than a, the help. So how do we make sure we avoid those sorts of challenges too? I agree, I agree. Um, so I, does anyone have any um, closing remarks um, you know, based on the conversations that we had, or um, I don't know if, if Jerry wants to, to say anything to wrap um, anything up. 
Um, I just wanted to thank the panelists for um, speaking today and for the CREA Foundation for making this possible. Um, and I hope you know everyone enjoys the rest of their day as well. Thank you, everybody. I just want to bid you all farewell and thank you for, for participating. And special thanks to you, Patricia, for leading us and to the Career Foundation for being like-minded. Great. Thank well, you Well, thanks, very much. everyone. Have a good afternoon. Good night. Bye. Bye.